Uh, thanks for having me. I um, I have uh, time. I've been uh, blessed with time uh, to speak for a while about something that's near and dear to my heart, and it's uh, Black history. And I, I rarely refer to this presentation as Black history. As you can see, I refer to it as Blacks in history. And the reason why I do that is when you refer to it as Black history, a portion of uh, society feels like it doesn't apply to them. And so I just want to say that this is U.S. history I'm going to be talking about, but it's focused on Blacks in U.S. history. So I'm going to really quickly um, start with this slide right here. And uh, does anybody know who this is? Yeah. yeah, so that is, her real name is Araminta Ross. And Araminta Ross, uh, we all know her, of course, as Harriet Tubman. She was an enslaved woman who escaped slavery, made her way all the way to Philadelphia, where she could have lived her life as a, a free woman, but decided to return back 19 times, took 19 trips um, to free other enslaved and to bring them in uh, to, uh, to freedom. And the reason why I have her, her on here is for this one reason here. Well, also because that was the last picture ever taken of her before her death. And I just think she looks like a queen kind of sitting there on the throne like that. So I love that picture. But um, it brings me to this slide. So I wanted to let you know, and we always talk about history, and especially when we talk about uh, Blacks in history, we always talk about things being so long ago, happened so long ago. But I just want you to know that Harriet Tubman, uh, so the, on the top right-hand corner, the first person you see there, that's John Adams. John Adams was the second president of the United States. The person under him is Thomas Jefferson. And John, Thomas Jefferson was the third president of the United States. I have them on there because uh, when John Adams and Thomas Jefferson died, Harriet Tubman was alive. Okay. okay. On the bottom, you see Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, the 40th president of the United States. When Harriet Tubman died, Ronald Reagan was alive. So just to put it into your perspective, but our history really isn't that ancient. So the president of the United States during the entire 1980s was alive at the same time as a woman who was enslaved uh, in this country and freed, uh, made 19 trips to save other enslaved. It's pretty remarkable. Our history is not that uh, distance. You always you hear people talk about, oh, it's it's ancient history. So far from ancient ancient history. Um, this next slide, uh, you might be familiar with uh, that picture on the left. On the left is young Ruby Bridges. She was a young six year old girl who integrated the schools in Louisiana, uh, the first girl to integrate, first black girl to integrate the schools in Louisiana. And you might remember her. She actually uh, was escorted to school every day by the United States Marshals. Uh, uh, Norman Rockwell, I'll just show you real quick. Uh, 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 oh, how about that? Norman Rockwell did a painting of her being escorted. But the reason why I have this on this on this slide on this deck is because Ruby Bridges, the first black girl to desegregate the schools in Louisiana, is still alive. In fact, she had a birthday yesterday, and that's her right there on the right hand side. And Ruby Bridges is 69 years old. Think about that. The schools were desegregated uh, in Louisiana, and the, the young girl who did it is only 69 years old today. So we're not talking about ancient history. Um, which brings me to these three beautiful girls. You have Leona Tate, you have Gail Etienne, and you have Tessie Prevost. And I have them up there because for some reason, they were kind of written out of history. What people don't know or we weren't taught is that Ruby Bridges wasn't the only girl that day that desegregated the schools in Louisiana. These three girls also desegregated the schools in Louisiana on the same exact day. The difference is though, uh, Ruby went to um, a school all by herself. She went to France Elementary School and she went by herself. And so the media kind of focused on her because she was all by herself. But these three girls also went to school that day. They went to McDonough Elementary and the same thing, they were escorted by marshals to school um, in fact, uh, Tessie's dad lost his job because he was, they were trying to integrate the schools. They went through the same hardships that Ruby went through, but they sort of kind of been written out of history. I'm not quite sure why. In fact, the whole group uh, was called the Louisiana Four 
but we only focused on one being Ruby Bridges. That's, That's them today. I just wanted to show you them today. They are all still alive as well. And they are 68 years old. So the three, the four girls that desegregated schools here uh, in Louisiana, they're all 60, what's well, three or 68, one 69 years old. Now, here's a great little story. Oh. I'm going to take you to this real quick. Um, we, hold, we hold these truths to be self-evident evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? That was written by Thomas Jefferson, right? So it took the end of slavery, 1865, right, for that to happen. Uh, it also took the Civil Rights Act because you need the Civil Rights Act for housing, um, for uh, desegregation of schools, things of that nature. So what they say is that writing right there, the first generation of African-Americans in America who benefited from all those truths that should have been from day one, are any African Americans who are living today who consider themselves Generation X? Think about that. The full Constitution didn't apply to all Black citizens until that generation of Generation X. Now, give me one second. I'm going to stop my share and I'm do something real quick. I'm going to come back. I can go off of this one. It's not a problem, but I do have an updated version of this. And there it is. And I'm going to do the updated version for you. All right. Here, I'm going to share again. And then we should be back in business. Yes. All right. All right so I'm going to take us right here. Back to Gail. There we go. So I told you, um, so those three girls went to McDonough Elementary School. And I bring that up because in uh, Gail, she actually found out that McDonough Elementary School was actually going to be raided. It had been placed on the list to be torn down because it was in disrepair. So Gail actually pulled all of her money together and bought the building. She bought the building and uh, now it is uh, the desegregation museum. It's in New Orleans, Louisiana. That's the actual picture of what it looks like right now. There's also senior housing in the building as well. And she holds tours. That was in New Orleans last year. And I got the opportunity to go check out the building. It's now called the TEP. Center for Tate, Etienne, and Prevost, the three girls who integrated the schools. So it's the TEP Center. Just wanted to show you the TEP Center. It's kind of cool, kind of full circle, right? A school that wouldn't allow her to come to desegregate it, and now she owns the whole building and made it a desegregation museum. And as I told you, I said, Mark, 68 years old. Anybody know what this is? No. no. This is the Juneteenth flag. So, as you know, June 19th, 1865 is when all of the enslaved in the United States were made aware of the fact that they were uh, free. But this is the flag that represents Juneteenth Day. I'm going to describe it to you. I just wanted you to see it, but I also wanted to describe it to you. So, um, it's red, white, and blue for a reason, because they wanted to make sure that everybody knew that those four million uh, formerly enslaved uh, Blacks were now part of the United States. So that's the reason why it's red, white, and blue. In the center of that star, in the center of that flag, you see a star. And it's one lone star. And the reason why it's one lone star is because it wasn't until June 19th, 1865, that word had reached Galveston, Texas, to alert the individuals who were enslaved there that they were free. Now, here's what's so crazy. The Emancipation Proclamation was in 1863. So they were already free. But the kind folks in Galveston didn't feel the need to tell them that they were free. And so it took the army, uh, the army had to go down there and let them know that they were free. So that's why you see the lone star. And then that starburst, you see from the star saying, from Galveston, Texas to across the country, everybody was free. 
Now, when you see a flag, you generally see a horizon line on a flag. When you see one, it's normally a, a horizon line. This one's curved, and it's curved for a reason because it's saying that this country now has 4 million new residents. And so the horizon is getting bigger because we're filling up with uh, 4 million new people. So I just wanted you to see the uh, Juneteenth flag. If you've, uh, You might have seen it during the parade, but now you know what it means. And if anybody ever asks you, you can lay it out for us. Uh, this, do you know this individual? George, George Washington, yeah, the first president of the United States. Uh, but I'm going to draw your attention to this painting to the right-hand side of George Washington. Mm -hmm. On the right-hand side of George Washington is a man by the name of William Lee. And William Lee was uh, an enslaved uh, Black man who was actually owned by the personal slave of George Washington. And whenever you see William Lee, um, so you, what's crazy about this? I want to say by the mic. You've seen that painting. In fact, that painting um, of him is actually hanging up in the uh, National Art Gallery. But when you see it in books, they've cut out William Lee and all those paintings. So that's the actual painting if you went to the National Gallery that you would see. But William Lee had a really strong um, presence in the life of George Washington. In fact, if you have any opportunity to go to Mount Vernon, uh, at Mount Vernon, these are all the things you will see at Mount Vernon that are dedicated to William Lee. So, you know, you have a little uh, figurine there. There's a bronze bust right in the middle you see there. And there are two paintings. Um, the top painting is a picture of George Washington, who was a land surveyor. And uh, if you see next to Washington, uh, putting the saddle on the horse uh, is William Lee. And then on the very bottom, and this one's a little bit more difficult to see, you see the entire Washington family. But right behind Martha Washington, can you see her back, see him back there? That's William Lee. In fact, they say that, um, oh, let me bring you to this. This is one of my favorites. So everybody seen this before? Yeah, all right, right. Uh, Washington crossing the Delaware, and they're crossing the, I just wanna draw your attention to the front of the boat, all right? So you have three people in front of the boat, they're pushing the ice away. I'm gonna zoom in for you. You see that person on the right-hand side? That's William Lee. My, My entire life, I never knew that. It, it was wasn't taught in school, no one told me this. I just wanted to bring it up so you guys saw it. But they say, William Lee, if William Lee was not enslaved and, and was uh, a free man, that he would be considered one of our founding fathers because he was so close to Washington and was part of everything he did, including crossing the Delaware. All right. right, here's a picture of George Washington from the dollar bill. Here's, here's another picture of George Washington. Here's Here are four more pictures of George Washington. Now, now you're probably asking me, why am I showing you these pictures of George Washington? I'm showing these pictures of George Washington because I want you to pay attention to his mouth. Look, Look at his mouth in any painting you see of George Washington. So George Washington had notoriously bad teeth. In fact, on the date of his inauguration, he only had one of his own native teeth in his mouth at the time of the inauguration. And so I, as a kid, uh, well, I, yeah, but in his defense, hygiene, uh, dental hygiene wasn't the best in the colonies. And so, but what's interesting about this is when I was a kid, I was taught that George Washington had fake teeth, false teeth. Did you hear that same story? And they were made of wood, right? Wooden false teeth. Heard the same story. Now, uh, he did have false teeth. And those are the false teeth. And so if you ever have an opportunity to go to Mount Vernon, those teeth are on display. But they're on display for a reason. And, and I want to tell you the reason. When they made uh, dentures in that time, they were um, held together by a metal spring. And so that metal spring naturally wanted to always be open. So when you wore dentures, you had to keep your mouth clenched which, which is, is why I bring your attention to the painting of George Washington. If you see his mouth, all his mouth is it's funny looking, right? It's funny looking because he's clenching tight because if he doesn't clench tight, the, the, his mouth is open wide up. And that's the, they tell this story at uh, Mount Vernon. It's a great story. Um, but that's why whenever you see a picture, he's never smiling. He's always had this clenched look on his face because he's trying to keep his false teeth dentures from springing open because there was the metal spring there. Like I said, through those teeth. Here's the interesting thing. 
Those teeth, we were told, were made from wood. But in fact, they were not made from wood. They were made from ivy. They were made from horse teeth. And they were made from the teeth of his slave. At the time, at the time of, so if you look on the top, the top row was made of horse teeth and ivory. The bottom teeth are all human teeth. Um, in the, so I told you, dental hygiene was notoriously bad. And so everybody had bad teeth. So the lucrative market for dentists was to sell teeth or for, um, for plantation owners were to sell teeth to dentists to make uh, false teeth. So they would either pull the teeth out while they were alive or they would wait till the enslaved died and then pull out all the teeth and then sell the teeth. What's interesting about this is those teeth I told you are at Mount Vernon, they actually have the ledger uh, from Mount Vernon where George Washington actually purchased those teeth uh, from another plantation. So I tell you this story because I am so proud of Mount Vernon for not hiding this history. They tell the history and it's important to tell the history. We like to tell our history so that everything's so rosy and everything's great, but we had some uh, obstacles and it's important that you got to learn from not only uh, the good, but also from the bad. All right, so on the left you have Sally Hemings, on the right you have Thomas Jefferson. And Thomas Jefferson, as I told you before, was the third president of the United States. And Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings was a person who was enslaved by uh, Thomas Jefferson. And um, fast forward, I'm going to fast forward for you a little bit. So in the 1980s, there's a group of people who are descendants of Jefferson. And their blood descendants, you have to prove it by DNA. And they have this huge get together at, um, at Monticello. Right. And so one day in 1984, they have this big celebration and this group of black people show up. And, and so they're at the picnic saying, oh, we're sorry. Uh, why are you here? Like, oh, we're here for the picnic. And they said, well, we're sorry you can't be here for the picnic. It's only for descendants of Jefferson. And, and they said, well, we, we are descendants of Jefferson. And I'm like, what? Like, yeah, we're descendants of Jefferson through Sally Hemings. And they're like, I'm sorry, that's not true. And so the family, uh, had the DNA tested with those same Jefferson descendants at this picnic, and they came back a match. And so we now know that Thomas Jefferson, um, that Sally Hemings had six children with Thomas Jefferson. And um, there's a lot about this story that I'm not going to go into about the fact that she was only 14, one, uh, two, that she was a, a slave, so she couldn't say no. Um, so essentially, uh, today in today's society, we would call that rape. but um, because she was enslaved, she couldn't report it, but they had six kids together. And here's the best part. After this history was made aware by the DNA, Monticello actually recreated, because it was on site. They had excavated the site of Sally Hemings' quarters. And what was interesting about Sally Hemings' quarters, it wasn't in the same area as the other enslaved quarters. In fact, in fact if you go to Monticello, I was there, this cabin is right behind Jefferson's bedroom. It, it, it's literally right behind the bedroom. And so he would sneak out, go, and then stay in that cabin with Sally Hendricks. And they recreated the, the cabin just to tell that part of the story. So once again, I'm proud of Monticello for telling, telling that story. But I tell that story for another reason. The reason that... I told that story is because uh, I told you that they had six children together. The youngest of those six was a man by the name of Estes, Eston Hemings. And uh, when people deny that Jefferson had these kids, they pro produced all this information. So Thomas Jefferson had over 100 enslaved people living at Monticello. He only freed 16. All 16 were Hemings, right? And, and so there's all this other proof scholarship out there, but one of them was Eston Hemings, the youngest of all their children. And so when he was, they were free, they were free to go wherever they wanted. So they wound up going to Ohio, Which went one? to Ohio and they lived in Ohio uh, doing various things in Ohio. They're musicians, they worked in taverns, things of that nature. But we had something going on in America that you may not be familiar with, but it was, it was called the reverse underground railroad. And what was happening was, is that slave, uh, plantation, plantation owners would hire a group of people to go to free states to kidnap black people and to bring them back into the slave states to be enslaved again. 
probably the most famous person who had this happen to him was a man by the name of Solomon Northrop. And he wrote a book about it called 12 Years a Slave. And he tells the story how he was in New York. He was kidnapped and brought back and spent 12 years enslaved despite the fact that he was free. Well, Eston uh, was in Ohio and he was hearing stories that people were being kidnapped. So he freaked out and he took his family and they moved to Madison, Wisconsin. So he moved to Madison, Wisconsin, lived in Madison, Wisconsin, had three sons. Um, Three sons, married a white woman, and they dropped the Hemings name and went with just Eston Jefferson and lived in society as white family because um, each generation was getting lighter and lighter. And so that's Eston and his three boys. One was a doctor, one was a lawyer, one owned a hotel in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, but I wanted to bring this to your attention, and you may not have known this, but at Forest Hill Cemetery, in Madison, Wisconsin, is the gravesite of one Eston H. Jefferson, Eston Jefferson Hemings, right? Which is, why don't we tell this story? It's such a great story. A descendant of the president of, of the United States moved to Madison, Wisconsin. It's just a great story that we don't tell in our history books. Oh, there's another Hemings, the oldest of the Hemings. His name was James. And James Hemings was uh, Jefferson's personal cook. And uh, Jefferson kind of served, before he became president, he served as sort of the de facto um, ambassador to France. And so he would travel to France a lot and uh, do, handle affairs for the new country in France. And he always bought, brought James with him because James was his personal cook. Well, in France, slavery had already been abolished. So once he brought James over, Jefferson had two options. Option number one was he either had, he had to free uh, James Hemings and Jefferson wasn't gonna do that. And the other option was he had to pay Hemings for being the personal chef. So he opted to do this. And with that money that James made while Jefferson was in Paris, uh, James enrolled in a French cooking school and he became the first non-French person to enroll into a French cooking school. That's one. So he got really good. And he, they would come back to um, the United States and Jefferson would throw these amazing uh, state dinners, if you will. And people would come and they always wanted to try one signature dish um, of James Hemmings. Now they referred to that dish as macaroni pie, but we know that dish to be macaroni and cheese. So macaroni and cheese was invented by an enslaved black man by the name of Thomas Kimmel. I shouldn't say invented, it was brought to America by an enslaved black man by the name of James Hemings. Now, if you go to uh, Monticello, and I'm, I, every place I tell you to go, you should go, um, but they have the original recipe of the macaroni pie, and we use milk in our macaroni and cheese. They used bourbon. Yeah. yeah. So you get to try it. It's a deuce. It's a deuce. But you do, you do get to try it. But... So I have on the top, I have the macaroni a pie, which we know is macaroni and cheese. They also brought two other things to America. One is meringue. You see those white puff balls there? He introduced meringue to America. And he introduced my favorite, French fries. James Hemings invented French fries. So I like to um, think of James Hemings as America's founding foodie. <laughs> All right. So... Sure. So let me say this. So 1865, slavery ends. And the vast majority of Blacks in America lived in the South, right? right? In 1865. And in the South, 1865, there's mostly, they mostly lived in rural areas. There was only one place to shop. And that place to shop was the general store in whatever little town they lived in. Well, well, the rule of the day was if you went to shop, all white patrons should be served first. And then they would serve the black patrons in the store. So if you were black and you went to the general store to buy goods for your house, you had to wait till everybody white was served and then they would serve you. And then while they're serving you, if someone else white came in, you had to wait and they would go to them. So going to the store was this major ordeal. You could be there for hours, right? And also they wouldn't sell, even though they sold at the store, guns, they would not sell guns to any of their black 
uh, patrons because they didn't want them to arm themselves, right? And so they never sold them guns. Well, in 1888, all that changed when a small company from my hometown called Sears and Roebuck came out with the catalog. Are you guys familiar with the Sears and Roebuck catalog? I still go through this all the time. I absolutely love it. But I tell my kids, my kids don't understand this book. I, um, so they look at it and they're like, wait a minute. You're telling me everything you can buy in the world is in this book? I'm like, well, surely. I, like, I, I, I said, the best way to look at this is this book was Amazon before Amazon, right? And <clears throat> what's so great about this book that people don't know is that this book was one of the reasons why uh, Jim Crow laws were disbanded. It had a major, they were a major player. So what happened, Sears and Roebuck allowed you to look at their catalog and you could literally buy everything. I'm sure you're aware from clothes to hats, to refrigerators, to, I didn't even call them refrigerators at the time, but um, everything, houses. You can buy houses. To this day, there are houses that were built from the Sears catalog, right? But there's two things that were really important about this. Once this came out, those uh, Black uh, people who lived in the South didn't have to go to the general store anymore. The Sears and Roebuck mailed it. You could get it mailed to your house. So they didn't have to worry about going to the general store and they had to worry about waiting in line to be served. And they were given the opportunity to buy the best quality goods. Another thing allowed them to buy were guns. So they also sell guns. So it allowed them to buy guns to, save, uh, to protect themselves. There's a piece of this book that people do not know. And that is that this book is responsible for the creation of a new form of music in America. Let me tell you. Because of this book, musicians um, who grew up in the Mississippi Delta were able to buy steel string guitars and harmonicas. And when they brought these items, they began to create this new form of music, which we know as the Mississippi Delta Blues. So this book not only helped end, uh, Jim Crow, but it also created a new form of music in America because they could buy steel string guitars and harmonicas uh, from this catalog. So... This catalog was also responsible for the Mississippi Delta Blues, which is kind of a cool little fact that I would like to know when I was growing up and going to school. But that's why I do this presentation. Oh, okay. So um, let me get my phone. <clears throat> There's three pictures here. I'm going to start with the top picture. So on the top picture, I'm going to tell you a story. It takes place in Marion, Indiana. So in Marion, Indiana, three Black teenagers were accused of raping a white woman. And what happened was uh, this woman and one of the teenagers sort of had like a little fling. And one day when they're having this fling, her husband came home. And when her husband came home, he said, what's going on? And then she said, well, he's raping me. And so a fight broke out between um, this young man and the husband of this woman. This young man uh, wound up, winds up killing him killing the husband. And so, so while he was there, there were two other young men with him while he was there. They walked with him while he was going to meet this woman. And so, so when he comes out, he says, I think I killed this man. They all flee, but they get caught by the police. And word starts to spread in Marion, Indiana, that they have raped this uh, white woman and killed her husband. <clears throat> so the three are arrested. They're taken to the jail in Marion, Indiana. Now a crowd comes around the jail and they're upset. They want justice and they want justice now. So this is really important of this story is that when they place them in the jail cell, they put them in separate cells. And, and so, so um, the first, they, they bust in, they grab one of the guys in the first cell, they bring him out and they hang him from the tree in the front of the jail. Not satisfied, they go back in and they grab the second cell, grab the second uh, teenager, pull him out, and they lynch him in the tree. Now, they were going back for the third individual. In fact, they had tied the noose around his neck, and they were pulling him out by that noose out of the jail when a local uh, sports hero, he, was, he attended the University of Indiana, and um, he was well-respected. He stood in the way and, and said, stop, you've done enough. 
you've had enough of justice here today. We want the system to, to meet this out. And they listened to him. And so he let the third guy go and he ran away. He, he actually escaped. And that third individual like, was gone. And so they lynched these two. And that picture you see of the two who were lynched, that picture was taken by a man by the name of Lawrence Beatler. He took the picture and he published it in magazines. Life magazine was all over. And it was seen by a young teacher in New York by the name of Abel Maripool. And Abel Maripool saw this picture and he sat down and started to write words. He wrote a poem and he wrote this poem to, to explain what he just saw. And the name of that poem was Strange Fruit. Now, when he wrote that poem, he gave that poem to Billie Holiday. And that's the picture you see right there with Billie Holiday. And asked Billie Holiday if she wanted to put it to music. And she did. And Billie Holiday would perform that song as the last song every night when she gave a performance. Now, I want you to take a look at the top picture. And I'm going to play you just one verse of that song. And I'm going to uh, play you my favorite version of it, the one by um, Nina Simone. But I want you to listen to the words of this poem. There we go. Really powerful song. When you look at the picture and you hear, and Billie Holiday was performing this as the last song every concert she did. She had the lights turned off, so you couldn't see her on the stage, and all you could hear was her voice in the darkness telling the story, right? It's pretty amazing. Now, I told you about that third individual. That third individual who escaped, that's that picture you see right there. That person escaped and made his way all the way to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That individual's name is James Cameron. And James Cameron is the founder of America's Black Holocaust Museum, which exists today on 4th and North. And he created that museum because he is the only living survivor of a lynching. And so you have this whole story from the lynching to the poem, to Billy Holiday, to James Cameron, all coming back to right here in Milwaukee. It's a pretty remarkable story that we don't teach in schools, and I don't understand why we don't teach it. And there's the America Black Holocaust Museum on 4th and North, um, as you see it today. Now, now, during that time of the lynching, what was really popular was what we called lynching postcard. And so when, when I show you the picture of the the first, this picture here, you notice all the people standing around and like pointing at the body. Well, and, the, and that Lawrence Beatler was able to take a photograph of everybody, and no one's hiding their face. They're just kind of like, well, those pictures were made into postcards. On one side, you would see the picture, and would I, I, I've cropped this for you, so you didn't have to see the body. But on one side, it would be the the body of a a, a black body hanging from a tree, and then everybody would gather and would pose for these pictures. And on the other side was um, the, uh, the actual postcard. And he would send these out in the mail. And these things ran through the mail all the way up until about 1908. And, um, and when the post office refused to send them out anymore. And these things right now are, are, are really, they're, they're, you could find them on the uh, black market, um, but they are really uh, they, a lot of money. You can get a lot of money for it. Um, in fact, the, one of the largest collections of them is in at Ferris State University, 
which is the uh, Jim Crow Museum at Fair State University. They've, they've collected a bunch of them so people could see them. But I just think it's wild that we would put these in the mail of these uh, lynching postcards. Which brings me here. That's now, uh, this is referred to, look at the top picture. In the top picture, that's, that's what you see when you approach this museum. Now, the full name of the museum is the National Memorial of Peace and Justice. And as you walk up to the museum, that top picture, that's what you see. But as you go into the museum, you're going to see those columns. They have a purpose. So as you walk into the museum, you actually walk into the museum. It's in Montgomery, Alabama. You should go there, too. And, and um, when you walk into the museum, you walk on a descent into the museum. And as you, when you walk in, eye level are 855 coffin-sized memorials. And each one of those 855 coffin-sized memorials represent a county in the United States where a Black person was lynched. So this is why it's called the National Lynching Museum uh, Memorial, I should say. And on those coffin-sized memorials, it tells the name, the county, uh, the person who was lynched, and why they may have been lynched. And some of the reasons were... Uh, you know, whistled at a white woman or uh, tried to uh, vote. There's a whole bunch of reasons. But as you walk into this museum, it's on a decline. So as you start walking in, those once face size memorials start to go up. So when you're at the bottom of the museum, these 855 coffin size memorials are hanging above you as if they're be in a tree, as if they've been lynched, to give you that, that concept. And, and so, so they um, have a wall, and on this wall, they're asking every county in the United States where a person has been lynched, if they can grab the soil, whoop, grab the soil from that location and bring it to the museum, and they have jars of these soils in, um, of uh, dirt. But, but I want to show you. Yes. yes. I don't know if you do that. Milwaukee has uh, a lynching victim. George Marshall Clark uh, was a black man who was lynched on the corner of Buffalo and Water in the city of Milwaukee. So the current location of Shake Shack, you know, the Shake Shack downtown. And um, we would have probably never known that this story occurred if it wasn't for an MPS student who did a research project on this story. He had heard it. He did the research, looked it up, and they found his grave at Forest Home Cemetery. So he did GoFundMe, and as a result of the GoFundMe, they raised enough money to actually buy a headstone for George Marshall Clark. And I was at that ceremony where they dedicated the headstone. But uh, our county exec, David Crowley, has collected the dirt from the location, is going to send our dirt to the museum to be part of that collection as well. All right. Uh, this this is one's fun. So um, there's this, on the bottom right-hand corner is the Wisconsin Chair Company. The Wisconsin Chair Company made record uh, cabinets. So you remember they were like a record player and then it was a cabinet, you can keep the records, you can keep everything in, right? So they made these record cabinets and they made these in Grafton, Wisconsin. So that's in Grafton, Wisconsin. And everybody made record cabinets. So what the Wisconsin Chair Company, which is the company that, uh, made these cabinets, they decided, well, what if we put in a put in records in our record cabinet? So not only do you get the cabinet, but you get the records. They're like, oh, that's not a bad idea. So what should we get? So they decided that they would invite a bunch of blues artists, some of the fam most famous blues artists of our time, Brian Lemon Jefferson, Sun Ra, Ma Rainey, and they invited them up to Grafton, Wisconsin to record records. And so they recorded records. In fact, 25% of the records out on the market at the time were made in Grafton, Wisconsin. They were made actually at the Wisconsin Chair Company. And so um, all great, except Grafton is what we called at the time was a sundown town. And sundown towns mean if you were blind, you had to leave the town uh, before the sun went down. And you weren't guaranteed protection by the police. And so it was really dangerous to be there after dark. So all the artists who would come here would travel all the way back to Milwaukee 
and then sleep and come back. And so as the Wisconsin Chair Company started making these records and they made them under the titles Paramount Records, um, the sundown town became this barrier because the artists were like, this is too far for us to keep going back and forth. And so another record label in Chicago said, well, why don't you come down here? You can sleep here, you can stay here, you don't have to go anywhere. And so they did. Now, once that happened, Paramount Records didn't have any more artists to make any more records. So on Christmas Eve, the company decided to have this big party and they used all remaining money that the company had and had all the employees there, and all the food you can eat, all the drinks. And at midnight, the owner of Wisconsin Chair Company said, well, um, just want to let you know that since uh, we don't make records anymore, we're bankrupt. And we use what money we had left, not to pay you or to give you a bonus, but for this party, right? Now, everybody's been drinking for like four or five hours, so everybody's blown. And so they hear this and they're upset, so upset that they tear down the Wisconsin Chair Company and they throw everything all the old records, all the, everything into the Milwaukee River. So that company was gone, right? Now, a couple of people, there's a show that was called um, like Truth Busters or Myth Busters, or something like that. They actually went back to that location on the Milwaukee River and actually went into the river to try to find anything they could find. They couldn't find any records. If you could find an actual record of the time, it'd be worth a fortune but they couldn't find any of the records and everybody believes that they were all swept out into Lake Michigan uh, with the current of the Milwaukee River. But I tell you the story because the center of the blues world was in Grafton, Wisconsin. And how we, why we don't tell this story, I don't understand. But if you ever look at the Mississippi, um, the Mississippi Blues Trail, it's a trail you can follow down in Mississippi. There's like blue dots, like all down the South, right? There's one blue dot outside of the South. And it's right in Grafton, Wisconsin. In fact, if you're on Green Bay Avenue, you will see the actual blue sign, the Blues Trail sign. And it says, it tells the entire story of Paramount Records. It's a pretty cool history that we don't tell. But Grafton has created this jazz park. And that's where you see the statue there, the jazz musicians. And so they have festivals there with a music jazz festival there. So they do honor their past. But it would, it'd be kind of nice to have known that the center of the blues world was right here in Wisconsin. Kind of hard to believe. I want, I want to introduce you to engine company number 20, uh, 21. And uh, standing up there looking regal is Captain David Kenyon. He was the uh, commander of that firehouse. And well, so this was in Chicago. And this was uh before the chicago fire and it was the only all black engine house in the city of chicago so they would have fires in chicago and all the firehouses would be dispersed it wasn't like now where you have so many firehouses and they have regions where they go to everybody would go to that fire because everything was made of wood so they, everybody had to go to the fire to try to put it out before everything was all lost well, the chief of the fire department never understood why engine company 21 was always the first at the fires. D couldn't understand it. And so, so to, to put it in perspective for you how things were, uh, the way the firehouse was worked was there was the firehouse, there was the wagon, and horses were on the lower level. And then they had stairs that led to the upper level where they kept the hay and where the firefighters slept. Well, horses are really smart. And so the horses just realized we can just walk up the stairs and eat the hay. So the horses would walk up the stairs and eat the hay. So what they decided to do, said we're gonna get rid of these stairs and we're gonna make spiral staircase. That way the horses can't walk up the stairs. Uh, can't walk up the stairs, but it also makes it really slow for you to get to a fire because everybody, one person at a time can go down these spiral staircases. Well, one day the, uh, fire chief faked a fire and so that all the firehouses will respond and he went inside the firehouse at number 21 to figure out watch them how fast and they got out fast and he couldn't understand how they got out fast when he got in there he noticed they had removed the spiral staircase and they had replaced it with a wooden pole 
And so the firefighters would just slide down this pole. They would get out and they would be gone. And on that date, the uh, fire chief found out that the fire pole was a great way to get these firefighters out of the house quick. So Captain David Kenyon and Firehouse Number 21 are the inventors of the fire pole. In fact, that fire pole was actually placed in um, firehouses all over the country. Then the fire department in Boston made them brass, and they were brass fire um, fire poles. And then eventually they took the fire poles out completely because too many of the firefighters were breaking their ankles and everything else sliding down. So, but we don't have fire, uh, we, don't, we don't have usable fire poles anymore. Um, but David Kenyon was the inventor of the fire pole. Anybody know that already? Anybody knew that? All, All right. right. In the interest of time, I'm only going to do a couple more because I, 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 I am sympathetic to everybody's time and not to mention it's Packer Bears week. So um, I have to get out of here. I'm going to leave off with uh, Gladys West. So Gladys West was a, um, uh, a mathematician. And she worked for the Navy starting in 1950. And she was the only black woman mathematician that worked for the Navy. So, so the, the Navy uh, later on said, hey, we have this job. We have satellites all over space. Yeah. And we need you to cre uh, create a program that can let us know where these satellites are at all times. So, so Gladys started doing her algorithms. And she came up with this algorithm where they could pinpoint where every satellite over the globe, over the, the world was. And they knew it every time. And while she did that, she realized that while she could find where they were, they could find where she was. And on that day, Gladys West invented GPS, the Global Positioning System. Now, Gladys West is still alive today. She's 92 years old. And she has yet to ever use GPS. She still believes in paper maps. She doesn't believe in GPS, but she's the inventor of GPS. So I'm gonna leave off on that one. Um, I have, I do this. I have literally about 370 slides, uh, but I'm gonna stay off, leave off on this one. Does anyone have any questions for me? Yes, ma'am, please. That's absolutely. Now, I'm not aware of the Milwaukee connection. So the, so the question for those online was that there was a Milwaukee public school that had a swimming pool. Um, the schools were about to be desegregated. And so they didn't want black kids and white kids to swim together. So they cemented over that swimming pool. Now, um, the, the first story of that, there was a, a, a young black man in uh, Florida and he went to a public pool. There were public pools for blacks and whites, but they never mingled. And someone dared him to jump into the pool, the white pool, which he did. He was arrested. And they drained the pool, closed it for a week to clean it, and then filled it back for him to come in. And that was launched these things that we called swim-ins, where black uh, people would just show up at pools and to just start using the pool. Uh, using the pool. Here's the interesting thing that you may not have known about Milwaukee. So Milwaukee, um, our beach was segregated. So uh, there's only like one day a month that blacks were allowed to go to the beach at, in, in Milwaukee. And on that one day of the week they went there, the white residents of Milwaukee referred to Bradford Beach as Monkey Island. And they would call it Monkey Island. When they, but people don't realize that was part of our history too here, that our beaches uh, were segregated as well. Uh, I, it, it had to be 68, right? Because the Civil Rights Act. Yeah, no, no, no. It had to be 68. Because the civil rights, that's when the uh, last well, the last civil rights act was 71, but 68 was the one that no discrimination to public accommodation. So, no, thank you all. I appreciate it.